There we go. Okay, there's always something, right? Always something. Um, so, hello. Thanks for letting me know, McBuffin. Um, yep, so we're here. It's Saturday night. But uh, unfortunately, my fabulous co-host cannot make it here tonight. So, um, I am just here on my lonesome with a general Q&A. We we're going to talk about Anne of Green Gables, episodes 1 through 3. And I may still talk a bit about Anne. I've already talked at length, um, but um, I'll, I'll do what I can here to, to talk about it and, and get folks and, and do some chatting about that. But uh, yeah, we're just going to go kind of easy tonight uh, and, uh, and just kind of do general anime Q&A. Um, I am nearing the end of Anne of Green Gables and up to episode 45, so five episodes left. Um, and I have realized that I never read Anne of Green Gables as a kid. I thought I had. I was sure I had, but apparently I didn't. Um, so that's kind of an interesting surprise. And, uh, because there's, there's stuff here at the end where I'm like, wow, this is kind of out of nowhere. Uh, so, yeah, that's going to be something I'm going to be, uh, I'm probably going to go back and, and reread it. Because there's some, definitely some evolution of, of the character. Um, yes, I have seen the new Bebop, uh, trailer, and I am now seeing... There's an interesting thing. Um, it is not showing the bottom of that. So we may have to readjust the chat a little bit. Um, and then if I go to properties, uh, edit transformation, um, top, let's try that. Nope, too much. Let's try that. See if that works. Um, cool. So yeah, watch the new Cowboy Bebop trailer. Um, I like it. I, I think they did a, a nice job of mimicking the original anime trailer um, with the live action characters in a way that is kind of a, an amalgam of the two. Where it's clearly, you know, um, it's clearly not entirely live action. Some of the like the the, the silhouettes. Um, I think it's a, it's a really cool kind of a, kind of a trailer thing. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm not too, like, horrified by the live-action Netflix Cowboy Bebop. Like, I, I feel like it can be whatever it wants to be. Um, I'll judge it when it comes out, and I don't feel like we have to scream and yell about it. Um, and I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful in the sense that I want to see what that looks like. I want to see how they, what approach they take on that show. Uh, I'm more interested in seeing like what the actual show itself looks like because Bebop is a pretty stylistically distinctive show visually. Uh, and so how they're going to try to um, maybe not replicate that. I, I hope they don't try to look exactly like the anime because that just gets weird. Um, but I'm hoping that we'll see something interesting out of that. That they'll, they'll do something stylized with a live action uh, Kemba Bebop. So Fingers crossed. We'll see. But again, if it, if it doesn't work out, then fine. Like I don't, I don't think it cheapens Cowboy Bebop that um, if if the live action version isn't up to our personal snuffs. But yeah, I'm intrigued. Um, and it's tough because the characters in Bebop are fairly anime. Um, they're pretty big characters, which is not a bad thing. Um, but seeing how those translate to live action characters is going to be interesting. So, intrigued. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, getting near the end of, of Anne. So, hopefully, I'll finish that up uh, this week. I um, actually got a couple of things at um, Gen Con last week. So, last week I was at the Big Tabletop Gaming Convention Gen Con, which was cool, a lot of fun. Uh, it's over in Indianapolis. Uh, it's a big. Um, they have, uh, you know, D&D &D and Pathfinder and tons and tons of board games. Um, literally hundreds and hundreds of board games just to play and, of course, to buy. Um, and so that was really cool. Um, got to play some games I hadn't before. King of Tokyo, where you play kaiju um, fighting each other in, uh, in Tokyo uh, and outside of Tokyo. Um, that's fun. Uh, sushi Go, a little quick card game of uh, matching up little pieces of sushi. Um... And what else? Um, 
um, a fun little like civil and not civil war um, war of eighteen twelve, like war game they're kind of neat, and a variety of other things. Uh, and bought some anime while I was there, which actually let me grab it from the end of the room. There was a, an anime dealer in the dealer's hall, which was absurdly massive. You know, hundreds and hundreds of booths. Um, and so I ended up picking up a, a couple of things just out of kind of idle curiosity. Um, Puss in Boots, um, the original, um, um, directed by Kimio Yabuki of Swan Lake, with a key animation by Hayao Miyazaki. So intrigued by that. I want to check that out at some point. Um, and then uh, the Rolling Girls complete series, which again I picked up mainly because I, I like the artwork. Um, I've heard kind of conflicting things about this, um, but um, you know, I'm intrigued. I'm going to check it out. Definitely up my alley in terms of uh, ideas and concepts, and uh, definitely the art style. So, I'm going to give those a try. Um, you know, nice to really doing it just to support that uh, one moment yeah um, I think it is a toy mascot actually I think Puss in Boots is literally the uh, the toy mascot um, this is one of their big successes so that is that is exactly what that is good catch thanks Shelton yeah so I'm uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how those turn out but I want to get through Anne first. You know, got to, got to, got to get through Anne first. I'm also curious as to why the restream chat is not... Ah, uh, because of the whole thing. Okay. If I do... That, what happens? Does that make a difference? We'll find. We'll find out. Uh, transform... Okay, starting to starting to work there. Um, but yeah, so um, so that was the those are the only two things I picked up at Gen Con. Uh, no no games or anything. Minimalism, right? That that whole thing. Hello, focus, focus on me. Thank you. Camera's being a little weird, a little funky. Let me get that working. There we go. My little fuzzy. Hard for me to tell. I feel like I'm a little fuzzy. Um, so yeah, that Bebop trailer looks uh, looks cool. Or the opening credits, technically. Uh, we see Vicious. We don't see Ed. We see Ein. <laughs> yeah, I'm out of focus. It's weird. Uh, all right, let's try this again. Focus on the hand. Take it away. And then it should focus on me. There we go. Okay. It just needed some help. The things we get familiar with when we do, uh, you know, when we do this stuff for live, for real. Um, I actually did a, uh, uh, I did a, a panel at a uh, convention at work, conference at work, uh, and it was basically just. A, a Zoom call where you pre, you know you played back a video that you recorded before of the, the panel. It was on how to it was on how to best study and learn things. Uh, called learning to learn, what I called it. And uh, so, of course, me being me, I did a whole bunch of slides, and I had like me picture in picture, and I recorded me separately on like a, a nice camera. And so I, you know, as the slides progressed, I would move my my little picture-in-picture uh, -picture video of me around the, the screen so I wasn't covering up any like, text. And they got quite a few people going, you know, wow, like you really put a lot of thought and effort into that. And that was, that's, it's really impressive. And I was like, no, no, this is just me streaming every, doing YouTube all the time. Like I'm, I, I do so much video now. That the, all this stuff is second nature. Like I think about all these things. Other folks don't. I'm not, you know, I'm not brilliant at it. I've just been doing it for so long. <laughs> I've run into all these issues before and have people complain. So yeah. Um, so many things are just experience, you know, and getting, getting familiar and 
comfortable with what does and doesn't work. Um, which is actually the, the whole anime thing, right? Like, a lot of what we do and don't like about anime is, uh, you know, really often just comes down to what we're familiar with. Um, all that stuff. That's weird. Why are we not getting the bottom of... So it seems to be consistently chopping off the bottom of chat, and I don't know why. Um, maybe I just have to do down to there and then just chop off the bottom. All right, we can do that. Hold on. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, so we'll take a minute for this to review. Favorite character from the Genesis Evangelion, Mari Illustrious, so far. Uh, Patrice, by a fairly long shot. Yep, all about those micro improvements. Um, because it's really enjoyable watching a character who enjoys what she does. Everyone else in Evangelion is pretty miserable. Um, and Mari just has a lust for life, uh, which I just really, really appreciate. Um, it's just a lot of fun. You know, I was never too, too, too attracted to Ray and Asuka. I can understand why people like them. But for me, Ray's just kind of a dead fish, and Asuka's kind of crazy. Um, so it's just kind of not, not, not that thing. Um, I have actually not seen the G-Kids releases of Evangelion. Um, I have only watched the, the fan subs of... Um, oh, the pre-order. Sorry, I thought you said prefer. Um, I just didn't read it right. Um, I have not pre-ordered the G-Kids release. Um, they'll come, be coming up on Amazon Prime. If they're on Amazon Prime. I'll watch them there, and I think that'll be fine for me. <laughs> I don't intend to re-watch the rebuild films over and over again. Um, or Evangelion in general, um, so I'm I'm cool. You know, it's, it's uh, the original TV series on Netflix, the rebuild movies are on on Prime. I can watch them there, and I'm good. Um, you know, Evangelion is an impressive work, but I don't feel a need to own it and go back to it over and over again. Um, there's not a lot of anime I go back and rewatch, to be honest. Uh, Ghibli's about the only one, and even then, it's usually introducing it to somebody else. Um, frankly, I've rewatched Ghibli so often now that I feel like I should hold back on just constantly rewatching those until they just become like, kind of memorized. Like I, want, I want them to keep, um, keep to stay fresh to an extent. Um, I don't watch much seasonal anime. I watch a little bit here and there. Um, I do watch the first episode of every show, of every show, every season, pretty much. Um, but I don't necessarily follow all of them. Um, there's just too much, and I'm I'm slow at watching anime, to be honest. Uh, I've slowed down. I'm getting better. I'm watching more anime now than I, I used to, um, you know, a year or two ago. But um, it's just you know a few episodes a day uh, at most, and so for me that just means catching up on, on older shows. Um, it's just, it's hard to do that. Yeah, I have watched Mobile Suit, rewatched Mobile Suit Gundam probably four times now. I think three or four times now. Um, uh, but again, that's also introducing it to other people. I haven't like gone back and said, okay, I'm going to sit down and rewatch Gundam myself. Um, but yeah, it definitely rewards rewatching. There's there's a there's quite a bit in original Gundam that's uh, you're like, oh, I, I like how they built from this one to the next. And we'll be getting a movie remake. Of the, of the missing episode of Original Gundam, which excites me a lot. Um, I'm very uh, curious to see about that. Your favorite Ghibli film was only yesterday. That's awesome. That is a particular favorite of mine. Um, I don't know that it's like at the top of my list, but uh, Only Yesterday is a, a, a really interesting film. It's, you know, not your typical Ghibli film in the sense that it's about an adult woman looking back on her childhood. Um, it's about kind of nostalgia in that sense. Um, it, it's quite different. Um, it's uh, uh, it's it's got a slightly more urban perspective than a lot of Ghibli films, which I'm not complaining about. It's just very different. It's uh, it, it's re it's really cool, and and it's also neat because we don't get to see in anime a lot of the 1960s, um, and how and how and why that was kind of a golden age for Japan, and how how it felt like. This was kind of like the 50s in, in America, you know, this, this, this time of, uh, of a rising middle class and, 
and uh, things were just kind of great in a lot of people's minds uh, in the 60s in Japan. Um, one person have called, called it like the second golden age of Japan after the Edo period. Um, and so we get to see that in a really strong way in Only Yesterday, which is cool. <laughs> I hear that in man. Uh, have you ever watched Legend of the Galactic Heroes? I watched the first episode of the original and of the remake. And in both cases, I was like, I'm bored. Um, like, I, I can grasp the appeal, the, the, the big, complex space opera. And I don't mean complex in the sense of, you know, incomprehensible. I mean it in the sense of just, you know, many characters, you know, cast of thousands, epic kind of a story. Um, by the end of the first episode, I, was, I had not been pulled in yet. So maybe I'll be able to pull, uh, pull back. Um, oh, that's interesting, uh, Matt. Yeah, sometimes going back to a show um, is just not the right thing, the right time. And sometimes I go, go back to a show like it's better than it was before. Like you just weren't there for it at the time. You, know, you weren't ready for it, which is fine. Um, I started Heidi once, uh, twice now, first episode, and it's like, oh, this is awesome. I should watch more. And then <laughs> never got to more of it. Um, so one of these days is going to be I'm, it's gonna be my time for Heidi. Um, Eva, I tried multiple times, could not get into. And then finally, a few years ago, I was like, okay, this is, now's the time. Like a year or two ago. Um, yeah, for some reason, and Legends is probably one of, another one of those. Legends of Galactic Heroes is, again, probably one of those shows where one of these days, like, it's going to be my time for it. Um, it's just the reality. People have recommended, I got a good chunk of the way through Ergo Proxy and really enjoyed it. And then, unfortunately, one of those things where, again, you get partway through and just get distracted and don't go back to it. So I'd probably have to, like, reread and catch up to where I was before, which is unfortunate. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the thing is that you know if I want to watch Eva, it's not hard to find. If I want to watch Gundam, like it, it's on Crunchyroll. Like so many of these things are pretty widely available. Mm. I hear you, I wish there was more five star stories. That's right up my alley. Um, that's an OVA that I love. Uh, and a manga that I love and I can't get enough of, and unfortunately is not easy to get in English, uh, unless you want to track down the fan subs or the, the scan visions, which of course are a thing. Um, just haven't done that yet. But uh, what I've read and seen is five star stories. I'm like, ooh, yes. This kind of uh, absurdly big uh, space opera, uh, epic mecha stuff is uh, was definitely my, my deal. Obviously not quite like, you know, Galactic Heroes is a little more grounded, uh, a little more hard sci-fi. But, um, yeah, have the first like, volume issue of Five Star Stories right over there. But there's a mess. Just didn't, didn't work out. Sad. Oops. Transition over the... Eh, okay, that seems the same. Okay. Yeah, that's the thing, McPuffin, is it went very, very, very out of print. And unfortunately, the... Uh, so for those not familiar, Five Star Stories, again, mecha uh, epic... The original author actually like set up a company specifically like that he ran specifically to release it in English and to like oversee the English translation, and then that kind of ground to a halt because of financial things and so forth and so on, and he hasn't continued it, and unfortunately like it can't continue without him, and so like and apparently he's not interested in other people like taking it on, so it's just kind of under his aegis and he isn't doing anything with it but he's not actually doing it so you know so it's kind of stuck like unless he's act willing to actually let somebody else take control of it we can't ever get any more of that manga sadly so it's yeah it's it's rough um and there's tons of it and what is available in english you know each volume is you know 80 bucks each and it's like no i can't uh but very cool what there is of it. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got, uh, where is it? Yeah, there it is. If anyone's curious. So, this is what it looks like. I actually had a poster of this on my, uh, on my cubicle wall at work at one point. Um... Some of the art style. It's a little sketchy at times, but very cool. 
Um, and I grabbed this back when, you know, it was fairly new, um, and so it wasn't expensive. Um, make sure I grab something that isn't. Yeah, there's some, there's some not safe for work stuff in here. Um, but yeah, the art style is pretty, it, it's extraordinarily 80s. Like, it's, it's, it's very, very 80s. It's very cool. Hey, Captain Lazar. Yep, five star stories. Gorgeous. And this is all I can afford. <laughs> is, is this, and yeah, I, again, volume, you know, it's, it's, there, there, it's not much. Um, but yeah, it's one of the misses. So one of these days, you know, sadly, probably, the, the mangaka will pass away. And then, you know, five, ten years later, someone will go, okay, so we're just going to do it. And, we, you know, it's got licensed by Vertical or something. And <laughs> here you go. Um, Little Wolf and Cub. I, uh, it's, uh, again, one of those things where I have not gotten into that. It's never been quite my take. Um, my thing. Um, I read the first volume like in, in the library. Uh, and it just... It, it felt a little too... Um, grimdark for my taste at the time. Um, a little too on the nose in terms of you know, really, really... You know, I'm so serious and oh, this is so dark and terrible. Um, and again, that was probably just me not reacting well to it at the time and just, just not just kind of bouncing off it at the time. So I uh, just didn't really, you know, didn't really connect. Um, and I guess part of the problem too is obviously it's, a, it's an inspirational manga. It's, it's, it's a lot of folks mention Lone Wolf of Cub as being a, an inspiration for their manga and so forth. So, you know, I just need to, I'm just not familiar enough with where it came from and what its, its inspirations are and what inspired it to be like, oh, gotcha, I need to get into this yet. Yeah, there's some kind of bizarre, like, thing with this. Um, oh, that's the problem. Oh, dang it. Right, I keep forgetting. I keep doing this, the, the chat wrong. Um, so, um, that is correct. I just do it that way. Yeah, I always forget the restream chat is reversed. So the most recent on the top. So it keeps getting, it getting bounced around. So that should be should be there. Um, went a little too long. Fair enough. Um, yes, I've seen Nadesco all the way through. Love, love, love Nadesco. Um, there are definitely moments in Nadesco that are burned into my brain. Um, for those not familiar, Marsh Desert Nadesco is a um, mecha parody anime that is also a mecha series. So it's. Uh, you know, it's kind of making fun of mecha tropes while also, like, telling a full-scale mecha story all the way through. Um, one of the great running gags is that the, the crew of the Nadesco, the, the, the starship, the spaceship, um, becomes increasingly obsessed with a very cheesy 70s mecha anime. Uh, Gekigonger 3. Um, you know. And uh, if you watch it... Um, it's actually very interesting, the, diff the difference between the dub and the sub, and I think I mentioned this in the past, um, that, um, yeah, I'd, I'd agree it's postmodernist. Um, uh, in the, so, Gekigonger 3 is a cheesy 70s robot anime. In the Japanese dub, they give it a terrible dub. Um, but in Japanese, a terrible dub is one that's just very flat. Um, not quite emotionless, because in, you know, um, in Japanese um, performances, often you, you don't really get very emotional. Emotional performances are usually considered bad, like highly emotional performances. Um, you want to be reserved to a great extent in, in Japanese performances. So um, um, it's, it's a little different, but you, you have this, this very, very flat effect in the Japanese uh, dub of Gekiganger 3 in Desco. So everyone's like, you know, curse you, Gekiganger 3, we will return someday. Um, that's how everyone talks. Uh, but for the English dub, they made a bad dub of Mickey Younger 3. But they did a, an American version of a, of a bad dub, which is horrifically over the top. And where all the voices are, you know, curse you, Mickey Younger 3! It's wonderful. It's absurdly terrible, terrible, like, you know, 60s DJ voices for Mickey Younger 3 in that, which is just wonderful. 
um, highly recommended. So whichever way you prefer to watch um, um, Nesco, it's worth checking out the other dub, the other side of it, specifically for that. Um, and checking that out and, and, and hearing the other side of it. Like, oh, this is what it sounds, this is what bad sounds like, you know, in another language. It's really interesting. So, yeah. Um, Nesco is great. Rui Rui is awesome. Um, uh, there was a new type Japan, which uh, uh, put that as uh, Nesco is greatest anime of all time. It was voted in their, their monthly uh, anime polls not long after it came out. So it was, it was a big deal. Um, and a lot of fun. There are definitely jokes in there that are, are just classics. Um, um, and But again, as folks are saying, it's, it's you know, the more aware you are of mecha anime history, the more some of the humor will land. Not that they necessarily reference like very, very directly, um, you know, individual moments from classic mecha series. It's more just kind of the tropes more the the storylines and so forth like oh i get it they're, they're doing this which is a lot of fun um so yeah very 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 worthwhile for those who are into that kind of stuff um but yeah i also uh a friend of mine recommended vagabond uh just being a lone wolf and cub and some kind of thing just bounced off me for some reason i think i still have do i no yeah I, i've got two volumes of vagabond over there and for some reason it just, just bounced off um, yeah, and Desco definitely has one of one of the the great classic opening credit sequences too. Um, it's not hugely flashy, but it is um, it is perfectly of a time. Like it, it encapsulates its show really, really well. And it's one of those one of those things where if you watch Desco and you hear, you know, just the opening note, the, the opening few seconds would be ah, the Desco. Like I, I remember that. Iconic. So yeah. Um, and the Nesco is pretty, pretty weird. Um, Gasaraki, we watched it for the third time. Um, Steve watched the first episode of Gasaraki uh, a week or two ago. He'll probably talk about it uh, next week if he's back. Um, by that I mean if he's available and you know, if he's not, he's not being pulled by something else again. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, and boy was he confused. <laughs> episode one of Gasaraki very much throws you in. To the middle of stuff. For those not familiar, Gasaraki is uh, um, a, <clears throat> a mecha anime series made by a kind of legendary. They got a, brought together a whole bunch of very famous mecha staff to make Gasaraki, uh, sort of a dream team. Uh, and it, the the intent was to make a much more grounded mecha anime series. So, what would mecha look like in an actual modern military conflict of like the the late nineties, early two thousands? Uh, really interesting, really cool. Um, um, I have not read Battle Royale. You are correct; it is on my shelf. Um, I watched the movie, the original live-action movie adaptation of that, which is very well respected, and my jaw hit the floor. Like I was just so so impressed by that movie. Uh, so I went out and bought the manga, but I have not wa- read it yet. Again, nothing against it; just one of those things where I'm like, oh, I you know, I'm looking forward to that, and it's that's going to be a a fun <laughs> you know experience. But yeah, uh, the Battle Royale um, um, live action movie is like, wow, yeah, you, you mm, mm, yes, you, you, good. <laughs> that is, you managed to adapt. And in fact, there's another, I guess it's more manga to live action, but there's an adaptation. Um, you know, people say you can't adapt anime into, into live action. And again, I guess Battle Royale is like mean manga to live action. But that, that did it, that worked. Um, yeah, Gasaraki disappeared. Um, it was well received when it first came out, and then it just dropped off the radar hard. Um, it's hard. It's it's tough too because Gasaraki is a an unusual show. Um, it combines no theater or possibly kabuki theater. I'm not sure which. Um, with mecha action, but also as as Shelton's pointing out, you know, like politics, Japanese versus American politics, all sorts of. Like, really geopolitical, complex stuff. Um, so it's not for the faint of heart. Um, I thought it was really interesting. The ending is distinctive. <laughs> it's memorable. Um, but yeah. So. Um, 
yeah, it, 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 it's unfortunately Gatsuraki just disappeared. Uh, people just were, were not as into it. Which is understandable. Um, yeah. Battle Royale live action is insane. And just, you know, they nailed it. But yeah, Gatsuraki is definitely up there for me in terms of like, um, I have a friend who's more into like military science fiction, and I'm like, Gatsuraki. Be aware there's weird no theater stuff, but boom. Um, oh, I am so into the new Genshin live action. Um, the new Genshin live action is my jam. Um, that is the, that, oh man, yes. Like, they did such a good job. In fact, I need to go back and finish um, the first, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Netflix original uh, Trust and Betrayal remake, basically. Oh, oh yes. Um, Kitchen live action is is frankly kind of perfect. And I don't say I don't say that about a lot of things, but that Kenshin live action, yep, they they did it. Um, and I love, and I love Kenshin, the Kenshin anime. Uh, love love the manga. Have not finished the manga yet. Uh, that's it back there, but I will get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing about that is, you know, you kind of need to do that. They had a problem with, um, um, wow, names are escaping me. Um, um, with Yashiro, um, they had to change out Yashiro because he grew. You know, uh, Yashiro in the first movie got, you know, too big. <laughs> When they went to do, make the later movies, so they had to recast him. And it's like, well, we, we better get these done. Like, you gotta, gotta go out. Um, ah, good question, McC McCuffin. Um, yeah, there's... Um, I believe any given work should be able to stand on its own. Uh, and that's clearly true of Eva. Eva's a great example where there are, you know, I would say most of most Evangelion fans have not watched the shows that inspired Evangelion. Um, but and but are, are certainly you know blown away by and 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 impressed by it. So I don't think you need to go back and watch those things to appreciate a thing. Um, I do think that going back and watching those things gives you a more full appreciation for it. Um, like you said, the full picture. I, I think it, it really helps to understand it. And often, um, things that I would have otherwise bounced off of, I'm much more willing to, you know, get into when I understand that context. Excuse me. Um, excuse me. So there's, uh, there's, oh, yeah, there's, um, for example... Um, a lot of Miyazaki's and Takahata's work make a lot more sense and you can under, understand their inspirations when you go back and watch their stuff from the 70s. Um, you know, Nausicaa and Totoro did not spring forth full formed from the brow of Hayao Miyazaki. Uh, Totoro, ditto. You, know, you can go back and watch Horus Prince of the Sun and see the seeds of Nausicaa. You can see the seeds of Totoro in Heidi and, and Anne. Uh, I think that kind of that kind of that that's mm. um, that gives you an appreciation for something that um, allows you to understand that something isn't. Um, yeah, it gives you proper perspective. I would say on the thing instead of just like, oh, this is amazing, which yeah, it is, but right. Being able to appreciate where something came from helps you get a little closer to the creator, I think. Um, I think a lot of folks are intimidated by Miyazaki, and they think that Miyazaki's works are... They put Miyazaki on a pedestal. Um, and don't get me wrong, his movies are, are, are wondrous. But they, without going back and understanding Miyazaki's earlier work, they think... You know, he started at this extremely high level. And it's like, no, you can go back and watch, and there's a progression, right? There's a growth. 
there's a clear growth of like Takahata's uh, ability um, throughout the, the 50s and the 60s and into the 70s and then 80s and 90s. Uh, you know, Kaguya, Princess Kaguya was not his first movie by any stretch. And one of the reasons Kaguya is a very unusual movie is because it is kind of the, it comes after decades of, of absorbing anime at the molecular level and animation in general. Um, and so Kaguya is just a tour de force of animation because of all that came before. Uh, and Kaguya is a good example of where I think if you haven't seen Takahata's earlier works, it's hard to understand Kaguya. Kaguya is kind of an animator's movie. Um, it, it is much more of a visual feast. It's much more about um, communication through animation than a lot of other uh, Ghibli films. And so it's meant for folks who are like, oh, I, I see where he's going here with the animation. So, yeah. Um, that's where I think that, that context really helps. And again, I think you can watch Princess Kaguya and be entertained without knowing any of that stuff, but having that context helps. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think any work of art should stand on its own on some level. Right? I think if you create a work of art that requires lots of other things to understand, um, I think you're kind of doing your audience a disservice. Um, I think you're expecting a little too much of the audience. And obviously, yeah, you know, there's some basic level of understanding. Um, but yeah, I, I think any deconstruction should have some, something approachable in it. There should, should be something you can, you can grasp in the work itself, even if you're deconstructing something. Um, again, Evan Gundam being a, great, being a great example. Gundam in a lot of ways, right? Gundam is very much a reaction against cheesy super robot shows um, and saying, let's do a war story with this giant robot concept. Um, and one of the reasons Gundam seems so melodramatic right now, uh, to us today is because it is trying to be serious. You know, it, it, is, it is trying to not evoke all of those weird, goofy tropes of the original, uh, you know, the, 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 the 70s giant robot series, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, exactly, and, and there's, you know, there's definitely a recursiveness to it, right? Like there's, you know, at what point is it like, well, you need to go back and, and read Aristotle to understand, you know, Infinite Jest. Um, but, um, I do think the more you know, and the more context you have, the more you can appreciate a thing, right? Um, it's like wine, right? You can drink wine and enjoy it, and that's fine. But if you've been taught how to taste all the different elements of wine and to, you know, roll it on your tongue and to see, oh, I, I feel that this in the back of my throat, this in the front of my throat, I can, I can taste nuttiness or fruitiness or whatever, it improves your ability to understand it. If you... You know, if you know that wines in a particular area are sweeter than other, than other wines, that's useful. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't enjoy wine, period. So yeah, there, yeah, balance, middle ground, the middle road, right? It's funny, on the way back from Gen Con, on the plane, um, I put on Audible and I'm listening to a, a, one of the great courses series on the great mythologies of the world. Um, so it goes through Greek and Roman mythology, um, um, gosh, there's a, a thing on like East Asian mythology, so like um, uh, India and uh, and some Japan and, and such, uh, and we're now into Africa. But they talked about the, the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita, excuse me, um, uh, and uh, Buddhism uh, as well, and, the, and all of those ideas. And it's really, really interesting this idea of. Um, you know, uh, the, the Buddha um, portrayed and, and promoted the, the idea of the middle path. That, you know, you don't want to just completely ignore um, spirituality and, like, doing good things and morality. But you also don't want to live the life of, a, of an ascetic who is so focused on what's the right thing to do that you don't live in the world and don't actually accomplish anything, don't actually, you know, change anything in the world. You're just kind of wrapped up in yourself. Got to find that middle path. Right, exactly, Shelton. Having a knowledge of past work enhances the experience, but it's not always necessary. So, yeah. Um, 
you know, I think intelligence is, and and knowledge, is important, and helpful, but isn't the isn't the only thing. Um, which gets into this whole weird thing around people around preference and people like and dislike, um, where I think people get really frustrated when somebody doesn't enjoy something that they enjoy, and like that's that's the that's the other side of the coin, right? There's there's the intelligence of understanding all the things that go into something, but then there's that just pure aesthetic preference of just, I like this, I don't like that. And that's just, that's fine too. Um, you know, I can appreciate all the things that Evangelion is going for, but think that Shinji is a whiny, bad protagonist and not want to watch Evangelion. I don't have that reaction. But, you know, people can have that reaction. Just like, I don't, you know, like... However impressive this work is, that turns me off. You know, fair enough. It happens. Um, and I think we can't, you know, we can't, or it's not helpful to insist that somebody likes something just because of how impressive it is. Right? Sometimes it just turns you off. Um, I have this problem constantly with shonen anime. Um, you know, people love that shonen anime and they go, oh man, you should, you should really watch the shonen anime. And I'm like, it just doesn't do it for me, man. Like, it just, that just isn't for me. Um, and it's great that it's for you, but it's just not for me, right? Like, it's, it's okay, but uh, it's fine. Um, like, there are sports anime where I'm like, I can see what the, the time and effort they put into this, but I don't like those characters. I just don't. Um... Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and comics are complicated because comics do so often assume a store of knowledge on the part of the reader, right? And they, 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 they reference so many past things from, from past comics. Um, and you don't necessarily have to know that to enjoy the comic, but that's often such a... Um, there's often so much kind of tied into the history of comics that end up getting worked into existing comics where it's like I don't I don't you know there's nothing wrong with that but it can also be kind of off off putting to people but also like at some level you can often just get over it and just read the read the comic and do you enjoy it or do you not right even if you don't get who Gwen Stacy is just you can read Spider-Man it's okay um Right, exactly. If you love Shonen, great. Go dress up as Haiku characters and run around. Great, you know. Um, dress up as Luke. I admit, you know, Haiku is sports, but it's Shonen sports. Um, you know, cool. Just means more anime. Uh, it just means um, anime is more and more uh, standardized and more and more generalized to the in the culture. People are just used to it now. Um, I definitely do feel like we're, we're reaching that point where, and we've basically reached that point where anime is, is effectively mainstream. Um, like, it's not being broadcast, you know, with the Olympics, but pretty much everyone 30 or younger has seen or, you know, is exposed to anime, knows what it is, and isn't put off by it. You know, um, you know they don't think anime is bizarre. Anime is just anime. Um, they may like it. They may not like it. They may not be into it. But I think anime is pretty, pretty much a known quantity at this point, um, especially in like North America, places like that, which is cool, right? You no longer, you no longer have to have these conversations where it's like, I like anime. What's anime? <sighs> Japanese animation. You know, like what? <sighs> <laughs> I had those conversations for a long time. Mm. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. 